everyone. It's great to be with you to celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month today. I'm Laura Mandel, Executive Director of the Jewish Arts Collaborative. And I sometimes feel like every month is Jewish Heritage Month for us at J Arts and the Vilna Shul. But we have a special something today, as you know. So in honor of this month, we and our partners at the Vilna Shul are excited to be with our wonderful friend, Simona Dineppi, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Curator of Judaica at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, to explore some important pieces of Judaica that really help illustrate moments in Jewish American life. Um, and I especially love that this isn't just Jewish American life, but specifically Boston. Um, and she's gonna shed some light on some pieces that connect directly to our city with some ties to the Vilna Show, which I think will be very cool. So um, before we move into Simona, Lynn from the Vilna Show will share a few words with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Laura said, I'm Lynn Krasker Schultz, Director of Programming here at the Vilna Show. We are a vibrant Jewish cultural center located in the heart of Beacon Hill in Boston's oldest historic synagogue building. Simona is such a treasure in our community and we're thrilled to have partnered with her many times before. I'm so proud that the Vilna and J Arts were able to talk with Simona and bring you this special conversation today. Please put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer as many as we can as time allows. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, so Simona. To kick us off, um, I know we are not here just because Lynn and I love harassing you into doing things with us because we love having you. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how the idea for this conversation came about? Well, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. And thank you to J Arts and Vilna Schul, uh, to Laura and Lynn, who invited me to give a talk about uh, objects from the MFA Judaica collection. And this works really well because we were able to link it with Jewish uh, American Heritage Month, uh, which is about to end in a couple of days. Uh, so. The idea of this specific theme of the talk really came about because the MFA, uh, we at the MFA were approached uh, to take part into this wonderful initiative coordinated by the uh, Jewish Museum, sorry, by the National Museum of American Jewish History. And you see here their um, dedicated page for Jewish American Heritage Month. Uh, they asked us to take part with content and images and material um, because, uh, as you can see in their website, which you can uh, visit for, I think, a few more days before the end of May, uh, they brought together about 40 museums and libraries across the country uh, uh, to share Jewish content. And I can very proudly show that we have our own tag here, our own icon that if you click on, it will send you to a grouping of highlights that we've prepared especially for May. Uh, so yes, so this is the group of works that I have put together. Um, as you can see, it's quite a wide range of works. There are medals, there is silver, there are two oil paintings and a uh, wooden sculpture that um, we will talk about. Next slide, please. So the two works that I chose for you today, and I mentioned it just a few minutes ago, um, are these two works. Again, they're different, but they tell similar story, I should say, of the wider um, historical context in Boston on those years. And I'm very, very pleased to hear that Jonathan Sarna is with us because maybe at the end he can tell us about those key years, the 1920s in Boston. He's a real expert on the subject and uh, much of what we know about is from his book, The Jews of Boston, um, which shows um, the image that I'm going to show um, very soon um, of the synagogue from which the, this lion comes. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with this painting called the Talmudist that uh, was donated by members of the Jewish community in 1926 to the MFA. And this already is worthy of attention because uh, from what I know, this is the only work that was purchased as an initiative of the Jewish Boston community and donated to the MFA. This happened, as I said, in 1926. The painting had been painting, painted in 1919. 
And um, the painter was an artist by the name uh, of Jacob Binder, and he was a Russian uh, portraitist who worked in Boston. He was fairly successful. And what is important for the rest of the story is that he had trained and studied with uh, John Singer Sargent. Um, if we go on to the, the uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, um, Laura, please uh, go ahead. If not, I'll just continue. Let me know. Great. Go ahead. So mm -hmm. I'll go ahead. So um, th there was a question of, first of all, who did the, who was the man, the sitter, the man uh, uh, represented in the painting? Um, it has been suggested that it was this carpenter by the name of Joseph Freeman, his family who's still alive, and Stephen Fine, a great scholar of um, antique sort of uh, Jewish art, uh, is a part of his family. But the truth is that um, this painting was not made to represent a recognizable individual. Next slide, please. Uh, because he might as well have been the elderly man that you see here on the left-hand side. This is a different painting, painted in London in 1906, so 15 years earlier, uh, by William Rothstein, um, um, a Jewish London painter. But why do I bring this up? Because very much like uh, Jacob Binder of our Talmudist, and this work is also in our collection. Um, William Rothstein used to take trips in the East End of London to look for models for elderly Orthodox Eastern European Jews that he could use as models in his paintings. Um, and very much like Binder, he, he operated and worked in the wider secular society, but was still very much drawn to Jewish tradition and the, the, orthodox, um, the orthodox world. Um, and very much like uh, the East End of London, we know that Jacob Binder would go to Dorchester and Roxbury to look for his subjects, for his, uh, for his sitters. Now I'm aware that we're using a different version of my last version of the PowerPoint, so I apologize if I have to ask to go back and forward, but we'll, we're doing our best. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to first go back two slides back, please. Another one, please. Okay, before we go into the story of the donation, which is the really interesting part for Boston Jews, I'd like to take a moment to look at the painting. Now, we all know that the internet is flooded with images of religious Jews, paintings of religious Jews and rabbis of varying quality, but this is a particularly convincing painting. After all, Jacob Binder was, whose specialty was portraiture, he knew what he was doing. And if you look at this painting um, of a, an elderly Jew absorbed in the study of the Talmud, he really stripped down his subject to the essentials. We only see the old man, a table, a bookcase with volumes of the Talmud, presumably, a large tome of the Talmud on the table, um, and a bare sort of brownish wall. Um, and this is significant because it really makes us focus on the subject. Secondly, the lifelike, uh, realistic quality with which he treats, he paints his sitter. Um, details like the wrinkled forehead, the, the sunken cheeks, the hands that painters often struggle with. If you, I don't know, if, I hope you can see the, the hands well. There are these protruding veins, uh, that are painted so well with such observation um, of detail. And perhaps the most beautiful part of the painting is the talit and the silver color around the talit. Um, he used particularly um, rich brush strokes to give a sense of the light falling on the silk uh, color of the, of the talit. And also the way that he conveyed the focus, the dedication, the mental effort even of um, the Talmudist. And he did that just by placing his hand on his forehead like that, really a sign of concentration. 
Uh, so this is a wonderful painting that we've never displayed at the MFA, and I really hope that we'll get the chance to, to do that soon. So if we go uh, three slides. Actually, Simona, we have an interesting question before you move on, which is um, if he's not praying, if he's actually studying, what's the significance or why is he wearing a tallit? Is that for effect for, you know, can you tell us more about that? I, my assumption, uh, my, my assumption is that he had been praying, he was praying and sort of from praying, he, he transitioned very fluidly to studying and then to praying back again. The whole experience of in Yeshivat as well today of praying and study are all one. Uh, so I think that's why. So uh, yes, again, he may have been uh, Joseph Freeman, but we can go on, we can go forward. And here is a really interesting, I, I think, especially for those of you who are from Boston, part of the story. Now, how did this donation from the Jewish community come about? This is um, a copy of uh, the Jewish Advocate, um, because in 1926, probably November, the editor, Alexander Brin, launched a campaign for the purchase of this painting for the MFA. Now, I'll read aloud the, the, the text, because I want you to have a chance to read it too. Uh, Binder's artistic creation, the Talmudist, to be presented to the Museum of Fine Arts through public subscription. Advocate Reader Start Fund by contributing $250 to the 1,500 needed to purchase the painting. And then he turns to lovers of art in general, uh, urging them to send to the editor any amount uh, for the purchase of this painting. So when I saw this, and I know that he actually um, showed a string of them in different issues of the Jewish Advocate, I thought, oh, I wish that the Jewish press was this passionate about the MFA um, and having works, uh, Jewish works in the MFA right now. Um, he went on for a few months until he succeeded. And if we go on to the next, please. Uh, Laura, if there's any question you want to ask or any question coming through, uh, please, um, uh, please don't hesitate to, uh, to do so. The reason why I'm showing you this other uh, citation from another number of the Jewish Advocate is because I think it's extremely uh, telling of the reason why Alexander Brin and his co-donors wanted to donate this work. He says, donate the painting, the Great Reservoir, which is the pride of the city of Boston, and I wish to present the most typical representation that a dignified, self-respecting artistic jury could make. And it's not by chance that I'm sort of lingering on self-respecting, dignified, pride. To me, it's very clear, and if we go on to the next that there was a deliberate intention to, a, a desire to be accepted, included, welcomed. There was an aspiration not only of Alexander Brin, but of the Jewish community, Jews in Boston in the 1920s. Also, um, about seven years prior to that, the famous John, John Singer Sargent, had painted on the third floor of the Boston Public Library, a famous uh, mur mural, uh, mural paintings that most of you will know and that can be visited today, with a, an offensive representation of the Jewish faith, synagogue, that you see here painted. If we go on to the next slide, please. It was the theme of Ecclesia and Synagogue. So, so uh, he was actually part of his whole idea of the triumph of religion that was seen by Sargent as the triumph and evolution of humanity. Uh, but we see here how he, uh, unlike the very celebratory positive depiction of Christianity, of Ecclesia, seen as a young woman enthroned, very much like the Virgin Mary, we have on the left-hand side a defeated, humiliated um, 
synagogue, synagogue, Judaism, on the floor, partially naked, hanging on to the fabric behind her. She's no longer crowned because the crown is about to tip off her head. Her scepter is broken into two, and she's completely, it is an image of humiliation. There is no doubt about that. Now, this enraged, upset, offended many Jews in Boston quite immediately, not only Jews, but also non-Jews, and throughout the country. The New York Times wrote about it. If we go on to the next slide, please. Now, what did John Singer Sargent do to uh, defend himself from this accusation of offensive anti-Semitic representation? He uh, said, well, there is a long, well-established tradition of medieval European representations of this theme, ecclesia and synagogue, in medieval cathedrals in Strasbourg and in illuminated manuscript. So behind me, there are very eminent uh, precedents for this. Well, he was quoting anti-Semitic material. Uh, and we don't know whether he was completely oblivious to what he was doing uh, or he was pretending to be. Um, we can talk about it more later. If we go on to the next slide, please. Um, so th th these images caused uproar. There was a heated debate that went on for about five years. And even though the attempt of the Jewish community to have synagogue removed from the fresco did not succeed, and she's still very much there for everyone to see and admire. Um, in the end, that was the reason why uh, John Singer Sargent could never complete the frescoes, which he considered to be his most important work, and he worked on them for 30 years. Um, I think um, if Laura doesn't have any questions about this particular subject, I will leave Sergeant and the public library and we will go back to the MFA. Great, I, I just wanna note, um, I'm very happy that Jonathan Sarna is with us on this because he actually went back to the Talit question and I just want to note that he said that um, to Lithuanian Jews, learning is a form of prayer and therefore that's why he might've been wearing the Talit. Um, he said, Louis Finkelstein once said that I pray, I talk to God when I learn, God talks to me. The, and he believes, or as, he, as Jonathan recalls, the Gaon of Vilna wore a talit when he studied. So that was interesting to me. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, right, John. Simona, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that. Um, so we can go on to the next object, which is something also that Jonathan can uh, help us with, I'm sure, because um, this sort of fascinating curious object that you see here on the right it's a wooden sculpture uh, a gilded sculpture if you go on to the next slide i'll just quickly show it it's gilded i'm not lying another one there it is these are shots that i've taken in our conservation studio and i'll show them to you in a moment so it's gilded we go back to images please <clears throat> so let's see if i can share the screen No. Oh, okay. Simona, I, I do see back. your screen. Um, stop share. No, it's be better to not to to risk it. So uh, I'll go back to the presentation. Can I go back to the presentation? Right. You Thank you for that. <laughs> so it came uh, as a donation to the MFA as a sort of individual secular sculpture, but it was in fact uh, part of a pair of lions that used to uh, sit on top of a Torah ark in the sadly now demolished synagogue of Anche Poland of uh, Warsaw in uh, Boston South End. And you see it here from a photo taken from Jonathan, beautiful book, The Jews of Boston. Um, and we know because of the Hebrew letters on the Ark that it was, um, that Sam Katz made this between 1922 and 1923. And it very much shows many of the typical features, symbols that you would see on all of these American arts that have a tradition that comes from Eastern Europe. 
from, of course, the lions with the Decalogue, the eagle on top. The, if you can see below the Ten Commandments, can you see that there is an open book with the blessing hands of the Kohanim, uh, the high priest, um, and so on. So it came to us as a single sculpture. Again, Laura, anything you'd like to ask? If not, I can just continue. Keep going, it's great. <laughs> okay, so the next slide, please. Um, again, a curious um, uh, part of this story. How did it come into the MFA? In 1960, this man that you see here, his name is Maxim Karolik. He was a Russian Jew. He was an opera singer, a very colorful character, a collector of American art folk and, and folk art, sorry. And he gave over 5,000 works uh, to the MFA. He bought the lion uh, in 1960 from an antique dealer in the Boston South End, together with this bird, this peacock that you see in the photo, actually, I think on the same day, and, um, and donated it as a secular sculpture um, to, to the MFA. To the next slide, please. Um, one, one up. Great, thank you. So I wanted to show these photos that I've taken in the conservation studio where the lion has been for about a year now to get uh, some treatment because it will be displayed in an upcoming exhibition called Collecting Stories, the, Inven the Invention of Folk Art. It was meant to open in May, but for obvious reasons it had to be uh, postponed. And I just wanted to give you a sense of how fierce and present and alive this lion is. Um, you know, in the flesh, obviously, that is even more uh, uh, apparent. The sense of modeling that you see in the head and the mane and the muscles um, of his belly and this dynamic pose is a rampant lion. So he's standing on his hind legs, his four feet are up because he's holding the tablets of the law. And something you cannot see here is that his uh, semi-open mouth is actually painted red. He's showing us his, his mouth. Uh, and the nostrils are painted uh, red as well. So it's a, it's a very striking and uh, present uh, work. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. Sorry, I should also say that just today, one of the conservators emailed me uh, for a piece of information because uh, they're preparing a special page on our website about the treatment, the ongoing treatment of the lion. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that. Now, who was the artist? Lynn already uh, talked about some cats. He was this formidable figure, very hardworking, woodcarver. Uh, you see him here, uh, also in a photo from Jonathan Jews of Boston book, uh, standing on the far right in a different synagogue for the inauguration of a different arc. And he made, as I said earlier, about 24 arcs that we know of. If we go on to the next slide, please. These are just two of the arcs that you can visit. The one on the top, is in Walnut Street uh, in Chelsea, and I really recommend the, to visit that synagogue. It's a beautiful Orthodox art synagogue that is trying to survive. And the one below, maybe more people know it, is the Adam Street Shul uh, synagogue in Newton, the oldest synagogue in Newton, again with a Torah ark by our Sam Katz. You will notice that the composition of the arcs is similar but uh, the position of the lions is different from ours. That's why I think that ours is particularly dynamic and alive. It's, it's standing, these ones are sitting down. If we go on to the next slide. Simona, we have one question I would love to ask you. Um, somebody in the audience would like to know about the symbolism of lions. I think we maybe take it for granted often that there's a lot of lion symbolism in, in Jewish artwork, but can you tell us a little bit about why? Yes, the, the lions are the ubiquitous motif uh, together maybe with the menorah 
uh, that you find in Jewish art, in Jewish ceremonial objects, and they are most uh, commonly associated with, uh, with one of the tribe, with the tribe of Judah. So th the lions that you usually see are really the lions of Judah, of the kingdom of Judah, but they became so much more because lions were a, a very common symbol in European non-Jewish art as well, you know, a, a symbol of regality and of strength and of pride. So the, the Jewish world and the sort of the, 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 the European wider context blended into making the lions a very, very uh, common motif. I hope that explains uh, the question. Absolutely, thank you. So I don't know if any of you had the fortune to be in New York 12 years ago. I didn't, unfortunately, when the Folk Art Museum in New York put up this fantastic exhibition uh, called uh, Gilded Lions and Jeweled Horses. I have the catalog here so that even if you didn't see, here is the wonderful catalog. And, um, why do I show this? Because Sam Katz's arcs and our lion really tell the much broader story of Eastern European woodcarvers who arrived uh, from Europe in the late 19th, early 20th century and started to make a, a, a business not only uh, carving Torah arcs, and you see here in some of these photos the decalogues, you know, with the lions, but also uh, they made a name for themselves uh, carving ca uh, animal for uh, carousels in uh, amusement parks like uh, Coney Island, for example. And I'm showing you these wonderful um, snapshots of the installation. To it must have been really a great exhibition, which I've missed, and I'd love you who have seen it. If we go to the next slide, please. You see that this image is fairly similar to what we've just seen. And this is actually our American folk art gallery, um, which is in our American wing. And I very much hope that we, our lion, together with the a very new acquisition that we made last year, if we go on to the next slide, please. This a uh, fun, uh, incredible piece was donated to us last year, um, and it was probably made in, um, in the 1920s, I would say, but it comes from, uh, we believe, uh, a synagogue in Brooklyn in the 1930s, and then in the 1940s, it was sold on to a dealer, the usual story. What is great about this acquisition and this very generous gift is that it shows us the complete set of lions with the tablets of the law and even with the complete inscription below it that tells us that it was in memory of a couple um, that were probably congregants of, of the, that were for sure congregants of the synagogue. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Yes, I, I would just for now, I think we can really take on this with more questions, um, but I would really for now encourage you to visit our website, to look at our collection, our images, um, and hopefully when we're open soon, you can come in the um, Invention of Folk Art uh, exhibition. And another recommendation, we're still looking for the missing lion for the companion. So keep your eyes and ears open and one never knows, um, you know, maybe one day we'll be able to reunite them. So thank you, but any question that you have uh, to respond? Well, and I will say, Simona, this is fascinating and, and we've already um, spoken to a few of the questions that have come up and I think you answered some naturally. But what I will say is I, I could listen to you talk about any one of these pieces for an hour. So I hope that we'll be able to do this again and again and talk, um, more about some of the fabulous pieces you have at the museum and that you've been working on acquiring. Um, and another conversation I would love to have one day is this whole idea of how pieces are placed in the museum. I think you have a really interesting way of looking at how pieces are part of the historic context, not just as Jewish. Um, 
So that might be a whole other conversation for a whole other day. Yes, there are many conversations to be had and, uh, and, and more slides and more images to show you. Uh, you know, we could have done this with one object. There is so much to talk about. So um, are there any uh, questions, any specific questions that have come through? Also for Jonathan Sarna, we're very lucky to have him here. So, um, so yeah. Absolutely. Um, there was one question that I just wanted to note, um, and it had to do with, you noted that the Talmudist was donated 100 years ago, but has never been put on display. So would you give us the sort of elevator pitch of how pieces are put out in the museum? Um, I think that it really changes according to the period, you know, the MFA is 170 years old and, and directions and change all the time. And they actually, they're not independent from what is going on in society. You know, we're now so much more aware of wanting to be inclusive and inclusive, not just of Jewish art, of Native American, of African American art. That was not always the case. Uh, we, we are changing that. In the specific case of Judaica, of Jewish art, this has never been on display. We never had, you know, the, the, the whole uh, Judaica venture is, is quite recent. Um, we have started to put Judaica on display a few years ago and we're adding more and more. We now have Jewish works in nine galleries. And so we slowly but surely make our way, make our way to the Talmudist too. Great. Well, I know I speak for all of us when I say we are very, very lucky to have you in this community um, and to have this conversation today. So we will definitely have a reprise since I know you'll all be interested. Um, and of course, the video from today will be available both on the J Arts website and on the Vilna Shul website, as long as well as on Facebook and Instagram. So um, if you missed any part or you want to go back, it will be available. Um, and of course, I would be remiss if I let us go without noting um, a couple upcoming programs that you might also be interested in. The Vilna Shul has a conversation tonight at 7 p.m. with Pulitzer Prize winning author Debbie um, Sinzifer on her last book, Citizen 865, which is actually about U.S. not um, and uh, upcoming for J Arts, we have Jen Ziskin of La Mora, the restaurant in Brookline, doing a special Shavuot themed wine tasting tomorrow. Um, and you can pre order the wines and go pick them up if you feel like driving um, over to Brookline. Um, so, Simona, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone at J Arts and Vilna Schul. And thank you for everyone who has uh, tuned in to stay with us. Uh, if I can answer the questions later by email, I see there are more questions. I'll be happy to do so. In the meantime, thank you and stay healthy and well. <laughs>